Allow me to introduce you to Julia. Julia is a well-known Christian YouTuber and blogger. Her mission is to leverage the reach of the internet to edify believers with God-centered, Christ-exalting content. She's particularly called to minister to women who have been victims of abuse, helping them seek healing in Christ. When her subscriber count hit 100,000, she was advised by her cousin to monetize the channel and start earning ad revenue and seek out sponsors. When she asked her followers about this idea, most people said, of course, we would gladly sit through ads to support the great things you share. God has obviously blessed you. A worker is worthy of her wages. You go, girl. Now Julia has nearly half a million followers and several revenue streams besides ads and sponsors. First, she has a special subscription option that enables people to access some of her content early, as well as suggest ideas for future videos and blogs. People who pay for an even more premium subscription also get some kind of free merch once a year, along with an opportunity to ask her questions in a live stream she does every couple months. When her sister admonished her to think more carefully about whether it's biblical to force people to watch ads before receiving spiritual guidance from her, she got offended. It's not like I'm driving a Tesla and living in Beverly Hills. I always tithe and I support six different charities. These income streams allow me to give more than I ever have in my life. How dare you judge me when the Bible clearly says that you shouldn't muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Besides, people don't have to sign up for the premium stuff and they can get an ad blocker if they don't want to watch the ads. Or if they don't like it, they can go listen to someone else. It's a free country. Julia has bought into the lie that as long as you don't maintain an extravagant lifestyle, you're incapable of mismanaging the relationship between money and ministry. Whether or not people like how she is monetizing her service to God is irrelevant to God. Jesus wants his servants to give what they have been given without cost in order to reflect, number one, the radical generosity of his own heart, number two, the sincerity of Julia's own ministry, and number three, the truth that spiritual things are not commodities to be bought and sold like everything else in the world's marketplace. As it stands, the sincerity of Julia's ministry is seriously compromised, since there is nothing to keep someone from thinking that she has ulterior financial motives for the truth she imparts. She is unable to be above the reproach of using Jesus as a platform for making money. God is more interested in her obedience than whether she gives her ill-gotten gain to charities or churches. Finally, Julia has failed to truly love those who listen to her, for true Christian love never has strings attached. Love lays down profit and pleasure and endures pain for the sake of others. has some of the most typical kind of pushback or objections that we hear all the time. Quite a list of them, actually, in her response to her sister. So let's kind of pick those apart, maybe one by one. First up, she says, it's not like I'm driving a Tesla and live in Beverly Hills. So the luxury argument, I'm not living in luxury, basically. So what I'm doing is okay. Yeah, that's a very common response to these questions because people have the idea that it's only excessiveness or uh, some kind of egregious use of wealth that would qualify as the kind of greed that scripture condemns. But a proverb that I've brought up in these discussions before says that for a piece of bread, a man will do wrong. Even if you're doing wrong for just a piece of bread, it's still wrong, even if that's if that's the only payment. And the question here is, is it wrong to accept payment for this? And the, the answer is yes, it's wrong to peddle the word of God. Uh, you know, assuming that what we're talking about here is biblical teaching. It is wrong to peddle the word of God for any amount of money. It's not just, uh, you know, excessive amounts of profit. It's any amount. Uh, is putting a price on the word of God. Yeah, and maybe we should even back up to the issue of her giving special perks to people who give at certain levels and give regularly or whatever, which is the Patreon model in a lot of creative circles. Um, maybe there's other 
services that offer a similar sort of tiered benefits for for donors. But we talked about this briefly in the last conversation about, you know, giving people extra perks if they give a certain amount to a seminary, for example. And maybe we should just briefly touch on that. Right. So there's two kind of perks that one can give. One would be uh, material perks, right? So like, oh, you get a uh, coffee mug that has our logo on it or um, or maybe it's not necessarily material perks, but it wouldn't be something, you know, spiritual like teaching. And so when it comes to that, I wouldn't say that there is a blanket prohibition on that kind of exchange in scripture. However, if you are trying to communicate with clarity that you are in this sincerely, I think it does muddy the waters of your communication. But what you typically see is that people are withholding some of their teaching only for those who pay. You can ask me special questions if you do this. You can uh, get access to the special teaching if you do this. John 18, 20 Jesus says, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Right? So there's there's something right about an open, transparent communication. Not, uh, well, if you pay me extra money, then I'll teach you the, the, special, <laughs> the special things that I wouldn't teach everybody else. So you would say, just to clarify, you would say that giving physical products, say like a t-shirt or something, in exchange for people signing up to give regularly as, as an incentive, would you're saying that would be okay, but not if it's opening up or unlocking access to, to extra teaching or something like that? So I'm saying that in theory, one could imagine it like I'm running a bake sale to, you know, to support this thing. And s- someone could come and purchase, you know, a cake from that bake sale, uh, wanting to get the cake. Now you're starting to muddy the waters for several reasons. One, what is their reason for giving? You know, is it is it to get the cake right. or is it for this other thing? And two, you're muddying the waters of why are you selling this thing? Is it one, do you actually, are you sincerely giving your ministry that you're giving or is it? in order to, you know, get people through this, you know, this fundraising cycle scheme that you have. Once again, just to use that phrase, it muddies the waters of, of communicating your sincerity. Right. So I'm just trying to state that when it comes to the blanket prohibitions that we have in scripture against the reciprocity of spiritual things, against reciprocity in ministry, it might not hit this square on the nose. However, um, there are reasons to still be concerned. But then when it comes to the th- thing that most people are doing, which is selling additional teaching or giving additional access beyond that for money. That's where you're directly violating the commands that we're concerned about in Matthew 10, 8 and 2 Corinthians 2, 17. Right. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. And this is good because this is a gray area. Like you said, you know, we don't have these clear prohibitions in this key area, but yeah, it does muddy the waters. One of the things, I don't know what you guys think of this. One of the things I would suggest is instead of having it as an incentive, let it be a surprise. Give people gifts of gratitude, but they don't know that's coming. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, we could always imagine a situation where, you know, your ministry has a reputation for giving you know, some pretty, <laughs> some pretty uh, excellent surprises. So it, it could run into the whole, the whole issue once again. But yeah, that's a, that's one way of addressing the concern. Right. It makes me think of the passage, I think in Philippians, that's called the thankless thanks, where Paul was kind of thanking the Philippians for their support, but not actually saying that he thanks them. Um, and instead points them to, the fact that they have offered a sacrifice pleasing to God. So I'm not really opposed to it, but it does, it makes me think of that. It's something to think through, you know, are we coming from a Western culture? I really want to thank people that support me, but there's other cultures that, yeah, like they're, they're less frequent in their giving of thanks for things. It's more just kind of, you know, for example, if you help out family, it's just expected. It's not something to thank someone for because it's just expected. I think it's an issue to think through, but yeah, perhaps it's not really a black and white thing. Gotcha. There's a very similar concern here that people have when they run a ministry like this, because oftentimes it's not, okay, I need to come up with some fundraising scheme. All right, I'll sell t-shirts or whatever. It's actually... Wouldn't it be great if my 
followers had t-shirts um and <laughs> how am i going to fund these t-shirts to get to them and the obvious solution was well you have them pay for the t-shirts so you know there's a situation where you wouldn't uh you know andrew you had suggested you know making it a surprise that wouldn't really work for that kind of thing where you want to you know provide them a way of getting t-shirts you know for example so i'm not sure what you all would think about that but my thoughts are you know once again the the blanket prohibition is against uh, reciprocity of spiritual things not these non-spiritual things so it would be permissible to provide a way for someone to to do this just like you know we talk about with books and things it makes it a little clearer if it's some third party that is that is selling them right like i don't know what people use these days cafe press or whatever but if you set it up through one of those things and it's clear that it's not you that's that's the one trying to make money out of this but rather the uh the other entity that's the secular entity that's creating these products but even if you did um you know collect something out of that w- once again the question here is whether or not it's clearly communicating not whether or not something is wrong with that direct sale of something of something physical that's not actually related to ministry yeah i i was just thinking the main issue is is um the attitudes behind it if you if you kind of tell people that if you donate we'll give you a a gift it's a disservice to those who are donating because for example i may want to donate to an organization and not receive a gift and i'd actually feel kind of bad to receive something back i, I want to give and not just because i'm better th- better right. from it so i think it's the the attitude behind it that is really the issue makes sense so let's hit the next point in Julia's response to her sister, she says, I always tithe and I support six different charities. These income streams allow me to give more than I ever have in my life. This reminds me of um, a response to my article in Bible Publishers. But basically the argument was that some of these Bible publishers are making a lot of money from selling Bibles. In fact, they make so much money that they then use the money to donate to other ministries. So they're like, you know, if we can't, if we weren't selling all these Bibles, then we wouldn't have all this money to give to, away to other ministries and fund other initiatives. Uh, so, I mean, basically what's that saying is that rather than you giving to those organizations, we're taking your money and giving it away like it's our own, kind of taking the credit for... <laughs> are overcharging for Bibles when they didn't need to. So the fact they're making such a surplus and they're able to give all this money away shows that they're actually charging far more than they need to. (laughs) Yeah. And then often they, they will be giving away something that promotes their own brand anyway. Right. So thinking of, of a Bible version, you know, they're, they're like, Oh, we're, we're donating all of these Bibles of our version to Africans and, well, what that's doing is just reinforcing the dominance of their brand in another place by giving all of these away, and they're giving in, them away with, <laughs> with your money. Um, yeah, so I mean, in it's, in yeah. some cases, it's simply money. So it's it's not even giving away Bibles. They just they just they're a nonprofit, and they have generated so much profit from selling Bibles. They just give money away to other things that are totally unrelated. Right. Yeah. So there's this idea here that is very pragmatic. If the end is good, then the means are acceptable, right? And so there can't be anything wrong with the means if it's producing so much good. And if there's so much generosity that's happening, there can't possibly be any kind of motive of greed. And you see this with a lot of, um, uh, there are a few famous Christian authors who don't make very much money from their book because they're giving away a large portion of the proceeds from the book, but they're still they're still in charge of that money. They're still requiring it from people and they're still deciding where it gets redirected to. So we have to think about this in a principled way. The question isn't whether or not it's doing more good in the end. The question is whether or not it was right to take that money in the first place. And and people should have the concept that ill-gotten money, you know, that there's something wrong with it and it shouldn't, it's not, it's not clean for use. You know, the concept of blood money, you know, this is a this is a phrase we have to recognize that there's money that, you know, is tainted. And in scripture, there's the there's the concept of the wages of a prostitute. Uh, Deuteronomy 23, 18 says, You shall not bring the fee of a prostitute or the wages of a dog into the house of the Lord your God in payment for any vow. For both of these are an abomination to the Lord your God. So someone might say, oh, well, you know, 
maybe this act was wrong, but it's okay in the end because uh, we're going to use it for some holy purpose. No, actually, you know, using it for some holy purpose doesn't then make that money holy. In fact, the money is, uh, there's still a problem with it and it shouldn't be used for that purpose. And you see this throughout scripture, this concept of the wages of a prostitute are, are brought up again. And even again, later in Micah 1.7, it, it talks about it in terms of uh, idolatry and false worship. It speaks of... Uh, carved images and wages being thrown in the fire. And it seems to be that it's not talking about prostitution per se, but that false worship being the prostituting out of Israel. And therefore, this would apply to any kind of, you know, misuse of the things of God, to any kind of false worship and idolatry. And I would count, uh, you know, a mishandling of, of the ministry as being part of that. And so if someone gains wealth through a mishandling of the ministry in this way, where they're charging for things that they're not permitted to charge for, and then trying to sanctify that by giving those things to holy causes, scripture would not would not smile on that as something that sanctifies the money in the, in the means that it was gotten. Something I've noticed with all of Julia's arguments um, that relates to this one as well, is that they're very emotionally manipulative. So... Using this argument, I'm sure she believes that it is right for her to do what she's doing in the first place. But then she goes further and says, you know, look at all the good this is doing. Look at all the money I'm able to give away. It's an emotional argument because if you then say what she's doing is wrong, it's like you're saying, oh, well, you know, what all the good she's doing doesn't matter. Um, all the good that she's doing from it is irrelevant. So it stirs people's emotions and makes it, it makes the argument seem um, more justified, but actually it's just kind of manipulating the way you think about it so you don't actually see the underlying issue. So something else that strikes me as very pragmatic in her arguments is that she says it's a free country, they can listen to someone else if they want, as though the argument is, uh, well, look at the harm that you're doing to this person, therefore. And so if you have some way of alleviating the harm, then the problem is solved, right? Well, you know, if if they're affected by this, they can use an ad block or they can use something else. But it fails to acknowledge that we're saying that the the judge of the earth has <laughs> has declared what he finds acceptable in in the act of ministry, and and that Julia is is failing to comply with that. So really, all of these arguments come back to the the main thing that we've just encountered over and over, which is you know looking at pragmatism over principle. And yeah, it just it, it's kind of difficult to get people to think outside of that box, to think outside of the idea, because it is true that that, you know, the end concern about all these things is harm. It's just we don't necessarily see the harm when we're not following God's principles. Right. Uh, we don't necessarily see how he's not honored. We don't necessarily see how others are hurt by it. A lot of times we feel like, well, we can be the judge of whether or whether this is good or evil based on what we see, not trusting God and his principle to determine based on what he sees rather than what we see. The kind of people that would make these arguments would also make the argument about the distinction between local church and parachurch ministry. So what Julia is doing is... I guess, effectively parachurch, being on YouTube. It's not like she's a pastor. Anyone can, you know, if they if they want, it's not like she's denying them biblical teaching and the message of the gospel that they can get at their local church. But to be honest, in Western countries, I think you could say the same thing about many churches because you could have a commercial church that, you know, charges an entrance fee at the door. And if people object, you could just say, well, there's, you know, there's another church just down the road. You know, you can just walk five minutes to another church. It's not, it's not like we're denying you access to the gospel because there's so many other churches around. So it's not, it's not a very good argument. Exactly. And one of the reasons I, I wrote all of these profiles is because it takes time to kind of unpack the immense creativity with which people try to justify themselves in different situations and avoid the core principle and dance around the command of Christ, right? There's just so many different ways that people are extremely creative in doing exactly what Conley just described of avoiding the confrontation of the direct command of God, clear teaching of scripture on this principle, and find loopholes for themselves, basically. So the, her next thing that she says is, how dare you judge me? When the Bible clearly says 
that you shouldn't muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. So she's got two things going there. The typical, you know, you don't have any right to judge me, which people love when they're on the defensive, they love pulling that out of the hat. And the second is an assumption, an assumption that she understands the verse about the ox and that it's immediately clear and obvious to all people that it supports what she's doing. Yeah, we've addressed that one a number of times. Uh, <laughs> you've even got that uh, ox shirt that you made. <laughs> but um, we, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just uh, it's just an abuse of that passage to then assume that any way that the ox is supplied is appropriate, right? Any way the worker is supplied with wages. Yeah, We've talked about this before too, but the passage in Matthew and in Luke that talks about the worker being worthy of his wages or of his food is not talking about the field being the employer in that analogy. God is the Lord of the harvest. He is the one sending the workers out into the harvest. And so the wages are supposed to come from him and his means and the means that he has appointed is fellow workers, not the targets of, of evangelism, not the, the field that they're going out to, but rather fellow workers who are coming alongside of them. And if you haven't seen my pitch meetings on YouTube, uh, you can go to sellingjesus.org and click on videos and click on humor, and you can watch a series of videos that kind of unpack the hole in this muzzling the ox argument and the misunderstanding, the general misunderstanding amongst Christians that this single-handedly gives a blanket justification for all monetization of ministry and everything sacred. And it does it in a humorous way. If you don't have a sense of humor, then yeah, don't go there. But (laughs) if you do, you might enjoy that being unpacked in that way. So moving on, she says, people don't have to sign up for the premium stuff. We've kind of touched on what she says here. You know, they can get an ad blocker. I just want to mention here too that this is placing that burden on the receiver of ministry once again, you know. What I wrote about also in the ad article, so there's a podcast episode and an article on sellingjesus.org about whether Christians should run ads on their ministry content. And that's the thing I want to I try to highlight in that article is the attitude of service and bearing one another's burdens instead of heaping the burden of avoidance of this distraction of ads and besides the fact of, once again, it muddying the waters, right, that we've talked about. And sometimes platforms will force ads onto your content and that happens to us, unfortunately, as well. So what we've done is we've made sure our videos are also available on an ads-free platform so there is an alternative. Unfortunately, YouTube is pretty pervasive in its use of ads and you can't switch them off under most conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's some creative suggestions, like practical suggestions in my article on how to try to to serve people when YouTube is forcing ads on your content or whatever. Yeah, let's dot church is the platform John's referring to. Let's dot church is a very uh, yeah, upstanding platform for all the for all the reasons we're talking about here. Uh, very much on board with with the approach to money and ministry that we're advocating for. So something I found very interesting in this profile was that her followers were quite keen for her to commercialize her content as well. Ah, yes. So just reading from the profile. When she asked her followers about the idea of commercializing her content, most people said, of course, we would gladly sit through ads to support the great things you share. God has obviously blessed you. A worker is worthy of her wages. You go, girl. This is interesting because in one level, I understand that people are just trying to support her. And that's that's a good motive. And this just shows, you know, we're just so used to thinking in a commercial mindset that sometimes we do think that paying for something is the best way to support a ministry. But this also reminds me of the story of Jesus cleansing the temple. Because in that story, Jesus drives out people who are selling and doing commerce in the temple. But what people often overlook is that he also drives out those buying things in the temple. So not just the sellers, but the buyers as well. And also a very helpful passage on this topic is the story of 
Peter and uh, the magician Simon. So in Acts 8, Peter confronts Simon who wants to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit so that he can lay his hands on other people and give the Holy Spirit as well. And he is strongly condemned by Peter for that. And so here is someone trying to buy a ministry and is strongly condemned. And so while the followers are trying to support her, their suggestion and encouragement Encouraging her into commercializing her ministry implicates them as well. And so they should not be doing that, leading her astray in that manner either. Yeah, that's that's a really good observation because we have this kind of feedback loop in our culture of affirmation. Oh, yeah, that's okay. You know, it's it's okay for me because they said it's okay and I'm, I'm not going to be offending them by doing this or whatever. It, once again, it's that seeking of the the af- affirmation and approval of man instead of the approval of God. To God, that's irrelevant, what your friends think and what your audience thinks. It's totally irrelevant to him. If you go to people for justifying your beliefs, you're always going to find somebody to back you up in whatever error that you're in, right? And what we're trying to do simply, once again, is push people to the Word of God to find their standard. And this is a good reason for people who aren't even actively involved in, you know, much official ministry to care about these kinds of things because they might end up giving someone that kind of support and not realizing that they're being complicit in something that's ungodly, right? And supporting uh, something that Christ would not permit. Bible says that temptation is sure to come, but woe to those by whom temptation comes. Uh, We don't want to be out of our own ignorance uh, tempting others into the sin of, of selling ministry. Andrew, I'd like to ask you, uh, what would you say to someone who will look at some of these profiles like this one and say, this is all a straw man. No one would say this kind of stuff. Uh, you're obviously, you know, couching this in, in terms that are real easy to, to handle. Most of these profiles are based on reality. Uh, they're not made out of thin air. Uh, didn't get an AI to make it up. These are all things that are prompted by real interactions we've had with people, either me or other people I've heard talk about it. A lot of this stuff is, it might even be hard to make up if it weren't real, because, I mean, that is what, as you get older, you realize, right? So much of life is crazier than fiction. So what I'm trying to do is, each of these people is an everyman, in, in a sense, kind of bringing together all of these real scenarios that we've encountered again and again in our interactions with people as we try to point them to scripture in different ways on this issue. Yeah, it really is incredible just how common these arguments are. The ox, the worker being worthy of his wages, you know, as being these things that uh, blanket permit all forms of monetizing ministry. This is not, (laughs) this is not something we're making up. Uh, We encounter it all the time. Yep. (laughs) So just going back to this this core issue, which is at the issue, the heart of almost everything here is, you know, principle over pragmatism. I just wanted to throw out that this was the original sin, you know, the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you've ever looked into what that phrase means, you know, the knowledge of good and evil, a lot of people think, oh, okay, this is talking about uh, Adam not having known good and evil before in, you know, any kind of sense. Well, he knew what good was before. He had experienced good. So it's not talking about an experiential knowledge in that sense. It's also not talking about, you know, having no cognition about what evil might be. You know, he was given this command. He knew it was wrong to eat of the tree. So he knew what evil was in that sense. What knowledge of good and evil refers to in scripture, as you look, is the capacity for judgment. You know, Solomon is described as one who knew good and evil because he was a good judge, right? So it's it's our desire to take judgment into our own hands about things that we are not supposed to be the judge of. Man was not supposed to be the judge of whether or not this fruit looked good and was pleasing to the eyes and, you know, would be delicious to eat. That was rather supposed to be God's judgment about whether or not it was good for man. And what we do in these circumstances when we say, but look how much I'm giving, but look how much they're getting, but look how much, uh, look what they could do to solve this problem here, that problem there, is we're taking that fruit and looking at it and saying, well, this is delightful to the eyes. This would be delicious to the stomach. And we are uh, committing that very first sin, which is wanting to be the uh, arbiters of good and evil based on our assessment rather than trusting God's assessment 
of what good and evil is. And this really is just a, a root sin that was the downfall of humanity. And just to realize how uh, how pervasive and uh, deceitful that sin is. While on one hand, you know, I really, I, I get it. I feel for Julia. You know, I, I recognize that people are used to assessing things on these, you know, quick judgments and, and you know, looking around at what harm is being done that they see being done. But at the end of the day, the true faithful Christian is the one who's not walking by sight, but rather walking by faith and trusting what the Lord has said, uh, not what they are assessing to be good and wise. Amen. Amen. And if you are Julia or somebody like Julia listening, we just want to say we love you. We we are excited about what Julia is doing. I mean, the world needs more Julias. I mean, she is not the kind of person we want to discourage in any way in what she's doing. The ministry sounds wonderful. I mean, a God-centered, Christ-exalting content, helping people seek healing in Christ. Absolutely. We we affirm and encourage people like Julia to do even more and more for Christ. And in a sense, I feel for her because she's young and she, in a sense, is a victim of a church that has failed her in many ways in this this issue. She's, she has an audience of people who have not pointed her in the right direction and instead encouraged her in the wrong direction. And then she's probably a part of a church that has never addressed these issues. And so she's trying to feel her way blindly with what the culture dictates and what her own pragmatism and logic dictate, but she's never had pastoral guidance on these things. And so, yeah, I I feel bad. So many of these people, you know, they're they're so well-meaning. They're doing such wonderful things for the kingdom. And we do not want to ever downplay that or deny that. We, and, and our love for what they're doing and love for them, you know, she's, she's reaching a lot of people with really good content that's encouraging and helping people find healing in Christ. And, and we do not discount that at all. We just want to see her thrive in her mission and actually reach more people, right? Because that's what we're trying to do over and over. And so many of these people fail to see the logic in how they're limiting their reach limiting how much impact they could actually have if they were giving freely. That's a little bit from my heart. I just want to share to Julia. If I were talking to her in person, I would want her to know that. I would too. Go get it, girl. Yeah, I mean, likewise, I would hope that by following the biblical model of funding ministry that Julia would end up having a ministry funded even better than it was before. So we wholeheartedly hope that these ministries will be very well funded through the generosity of God's people, but done in a biblical manner.